Well, this is Bob Ferguson, and this is the next episode of Life with Bob. And tonight is my extraordinary privilege to have Michael Barnard with me. Michael is an international filmmaker and a whole lot more, visual artist, photographer, you name it. And so I don't get any of the details wrong. I'm going to read Michael's bio. First of all, Michael, it's really grand having you with me here tonight. Oh, yes. Well, it's my pleasure entirely. And um, I look forward to delving into a variety of subjects with you. Absolutely. And we discovered last year when we really got to know each other that we actually grew up in neighboring towns at around about the same time in the Boston area. Big passages of our lives have been very parallel. So it's, it's really meaningful for me to have you here to really introduce uh, you to my world, my life with Bob world. So I'm going to read your bio. Okay. So it says, Michael W. Beinart was making films, artworks, and music since his teenage years. Michael has worked in the film business most of his life as a producer, director, director of photography, and editor. He's made films of every description and locations around the world. He's currently serving as the program director of the David Lynch Graduate School of Cinematic Arts right here in Fairfield. In 1980, Barnard established his own Santa Monica-based film production and fine art company, Bolt Pick Studios. Bolt Pick Studios is a boutique company that handles all aspects of film production and post-production, as well as production of visual artworks, including fine art, archival, inkjet printing. His film works include a series of experimental field films, and you'll have to tell, me what that, tell us what that is, Michael, in the 1960s and early 70s, shown at Millennium in New York and many other experimental film venues around the US, a series of films for the Transcendental Meditation Organization in the 70s, and since coming to Los Angeles in 1978, a wide variety of films, ranging from the Greenpeace documentary, Voyage of the Peacock, to the features Nights in White Satin, as a director, The Outermost Place, as a writer, The Invisible Kid, director of photography, Cries of Silence, co-producer, director of photography, and the award-winning feature-length documentary, Truly River of Glass as a director, DP, and editor, as well as the recently completed feature documentary, Secrets of the Sun, Journey into the Fire, which I had the privilege of watching with many of our folks here in Fairfield on Saturday night. That was in 1975, and Santa Monica 90404 in 2008, which have been included in festivals around the world. He also produced the ambitious David Lynch MFA in film student web series, The Next Town Over. He's published poetry, essays, and other writings in a variety of books and journals, including an essay in the McGraw-Hill book edited by Susan Suntree, Wisdom of the East, Stories of Compassion, Inspiration, and Love, a 320-page coffee art book entitled 100 Waves, One Surfer's Journey into the Green Room, and most recently, a children's picture book entitled The Red Tree, which I read and is absolutely charming. So Michael was born in Hollywood, California, grew up in Massachusetts, in Needham, right next to me in Wellesley, and the San Francisco Bay Area. He received the BFA from the California College of Arts and Crafts in Oakland in 1967, and an MFA from Fort Wright College in Spokane, Washington in 1969, where he taught as a painting, drawing, and art history instructor. His fine artworks have been exhibited widely and are included in numerous private collections nationwide. Public art commissions include a permanent 12 photo field installation of the Lewis Library and Technology Center in Fontana, California, and a combination of film and visual artwork, Rainbow Light Field, that was created for a large video wall installation at St. John's Hospital in Santa Monica. Wow. You've done a few things in your life. Yeah. I've been busy. And, and um, you know, this uh, shared shared experience of uh, Wellesley and Needham in both of our lives back in the 50s, um, that period is really obviously fundamental to all of this. Um, uh, I spent a lot of time with a buddy of mine um, at a place called the Morse Estates, which you, I think, probably know yes. about. I, yeah. It was... Uh, basically just woods with the Charles River. And we, we spent a lot of time there. We actually had a commercial trapping operation where we trapped 
uh, muskrats and sold the pelts to Sears. Um, and uh, now I believe it's a housing development. I think it's all just completely yeah. gone. But, um, it was, well, it was a different time, obviously. And then I spent <clears throat> um, quite a lot of time growing up on Cape Cod and Truro. And that also was uh, profoundly formative for me. Um, you know, the town of Truro and Wellfleet and Provincetown, that part of Cape Cod, the outer part, right. was sort of saturated with a, uh, a long history of amazing writers, artists, uh, thinkers, all kinds of incredible people. And that's the milieu in which I grew up. And um, that's where I became an artist uh, in a very dramatic fashion in 1963, um, where I just had a major uh, transformative experience. I don't know how else to say it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it involved a whole bunch of things leading up to it, but I was there for the summer, staying in our house, working at a local restaurant, and um, there was a big party in the house next door that went on very late. And I had fallen asleep early because I didn't sleep the night before. And I woke up about three in the morning because of the noise. And I went outside and there was a full moon and it was setting to the west. I went out to the hillside behind our house, which looked over a big marsh. And then there was a series of hills Edward Hopper's house is right there on those far hills. The moon was setting right about there and it was illuminating all the steam coming up from the marsh. So it was this incredible vista. I mean, really magical. And a switch just got flipped and I was like, I have to do something about this. And as it happens, the house that we had purchased the year before that had been owned by a sea captain who was an amazing artist in his own right. And he had passed away and they were family friends. We bought the house and so forth. But his whole studio was still at, there in the house. It hadn't been touched. So I went in there and there were oil paints, canvases, brushes, everything. Like, and I just literally started painting right then. I had no idea what I was doing. And I think in a week I did like 10 paintings. It was just like this incredible explosion. And that was it. My whole path was sealed at that point. It was very dramatic. Um, and so really my whole life has been in service to exploring the idea of beauty and the, the reasons for beauty and the power of beauty. Um, and, and, in 19, after I went to art school at California College of Arts and Crafts, got my master's in Spokane, taught for a year, my wife and I moved to New York in 1970. And um, I, was check, I was a checker at the New York City Center in Greenwich Village on Cornelia Street. And um, I went, I took all my art, you know, around to galleries in New York, thinking maybe I could get a show and was very shocked to discover that the art world in New York was not this idealistic temple of aesthetics that I somehow naively imagined. Uh -huh, yeah. It was, you know, the world in all of its pain and glory. And uh, I was, I was a little shocked. I was pretty naive. Um, but at the same time, in the summer of 1970, I had been showing my experimental films, which I started making in high school on eight millimeter. And by this time, 1970, I was showing them all over the country on 16 millimeter in museums and galleries and lofts. And, and um, there was a, a venue in New York called Millennium that was an experimental film venue. And I had a number of showings there. Um, and uh, at some point, I got a call from the SDS, the Students Democratic, First Democratic Society, which was a, quite a radical organization. And they wanted me to make films for them. And I turned them down because I had decided that um, I wanted to make films. I had made that decision 
that making films is the best way to affect the course of the events on earth, you know, and human consciousness. And that I wanted to, that politics was not a suitable and efficient way to change things, that changing consciousness was more important. Mm -hmm. And so I had made that decision and that's why I turned the SDS down. And then curiously, I went to teacher training and studied with Maharishi Mahesh Yogi and became a teacher of transcendental meditation. And at the end of that course in April of 1971, Maharishi asked me to stay on and start a film department. And so I, uh, with a pregnant wife, accepted and we never went home for seven years. We just took a complete left turn and- uh, uh, You and you and quite a few other people. That's right. Thousands of people took the same detour into another, another world and, um, and of course never looked back. And I, as time has passed, my feelings about the nature of art and the reasons for art and all of that have only strengthened in there my understanding that it's really a transformational activity um, and that art since its beginnings has fulfilled that function and that artists are kinds of shaman sort of people that create these works, these experiences for people that allow for transformation through the experience of beauty. So. Yeah, we had been discussing a little bit before we went live here. Talk about the role of the artists in society and specifically the notion that you brought up of the beauty response. Yeah. Talk about, let's talk about that. Okay, well, this is something I've been, I've been you know, exploring this whole notion of what is beauty? Why does beauty exist? Why am I doing these artworks? And over the years, I've come to the conclusion that the experience of beauty is a fundamental aspect of being human. Um, and that um, not only that, but I think that the, the ability to experience beauty is essential to the survival of the human species. And that I think in the coming years and decades, as we go through this intensely transformational transitional period that we've entered into, that quality um, of being able to experience beauty, uh, especially in a communal way is going to become ever more significant and help people uh, manage and deal with this. And, you know, uh, in a very sort of simplified way, you could you could even make a case that uh, you know rock and roll came out of America, and it's an art form. It has its kind of beauty, and um, it really did change the world. That that's a perfect example in a way. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's a popular art form. It's, you know, not maybe as refined as some kinds of classical and other kinds of music, but it's, it is understandable all over the world. And when one travels and sees the influence of rock and roll, and then as things have developed, hip hop and rap and all these other American based idioms and the transformational power they've had, it's pretty profound and striking. And, um, and now another interesting thing, rock and roll comes out of, there'd be no rock and roll if there hadn't been slaves in America, mm. which is, that's not to say slavery was a good thing, but you know, slavery was tied up with the beginnings of America from the very, very beginning in the Jamestown colony. Um, which was a corporate endeavor, by the way, from England, um, they, just, they found they were having trouble with uh, English people dying from malaria originally. And they couldn't keep enough people to keep it going because they were all dying. <laughs> and they, <coughs> excuse me, they found out about 
uh, a tribe in Africa that seemed to be more resistant to malaria. And so they sought out and enslaved people from this tribe to come work in that um, facility, that development. And really, so the beginnings of America are tied up with corporatism and slavery, which is interesting. Yeah. And of course, religious freedom with the Puritans. So this is very interesting mix. But over time, as slaves became more and more a part of American culture, they developed a stream of music which ultimately became jazz and rock and roll. And um, it took some white artists like Elvis Presley to really popularize it beyond the, the world, the black world. But in the end, that is an example of taking this terrible life experience and having it completely transformed by the creation of art, i.e., you know, uh, uh, jazz and, and what became rock and roll. It was black, kind of the blues and so forth. And it's a transcendently transformational kind of art in a popular way. And that has served to transform the whole world. And you, it's, you can't really deny it. Well, you may not, people may not like it, but that's the truth. And, um, and that, that hasn't ended. I think it's continuing. And then look at the role of Hollywood in the world. They've, Hollywood has created the basic story templates um, that have gone all over the world and created a kind of uh, uh, a transcendent and transformational experience for all sorts of people in all sorts of cultures. Um, now, it may not be the most wonderful thing for people to emulate America in many ways, but on the other hand, it's been mostly a positive impact, I think, in forming. So you see, how I see it is that the future is being created out of our thoughts collectively. Right. And, and I feel there's been, this may be a little conspiracy theory-ish, but maybe not that there's been over the last 60, 70 years, maybe a little longer, this kind of battle between different ideas of the future. And much of the battle has been waged through the use of imagery and music and other popular forms of communication. And I, and, uh, I like to use as an example, the image of the earth that was taken by NASA. Yes. How profound an effect that one image has had on human culture to be able to see the earth from space. That changes you when you see that. You suddenly go, oh, spaceship earth. I got That's it. That's a little ball of blue yeah. and green suspended. As opposed, to, as opposed to other images which have their own seductive quality, such as I remember when the... Um, B-1 and B-2 bombers were first coming out and they published these pictures in the paper and they were these kind of very dark but seductive and kind of sexy tech things, objects that were, they had a seductive quality. They were like beautiful in their own terrible kind of way. And, and, and in my opinion, that's part of the effort to create a future for the human race that has to do with wars, with, um, you know, uh, forcing submission of cultures to other cultures, all that kind of stuff. Right. Whereas the earth is a much more holistic kind of direction, the image of the earth. This is, these are just examples, but, and I think things like rock and roll and movies and all these other popular entertainments all play a part in this dialogue where we're creating the future right now through the nature of our thoughts, which then become obviously actions and things. And, you know, that's why I felt so strongly about uh, becoming a teacher of TM and making films for Maharishi because Maharishi, I feel, is the master of 
understanding what thoughts are and how to, you know, manifest the best possible from the deepest, most fundamental levels of consciousness. And so that's the best place to go to learn about what that is. And time has proven that to be absolutely correct. Um, so I graduated from TM teacher training a year after you did it in 72 and uh, taught in the Boston area and uh, started the prison program at Walpole Prison where we taught uh, prisoners and that became a PhD thesis at Harvard and rattled around the world. So yeah. Really? Yeah. I didn't know and, that. Uh, yeah. I, I, uh, I actually uh, <clears throat> started that because I was giving a lecture at Newton Wellesley College, uh, Newton uh, Wellesley Hospital, and um, a guy came up and said, uh, are Eugene Ferguson's son? I go, yeah. And he said, well, I used to I used to teach, I used to be in the guidance, the guidance department uh, in, at your father's high school. My father was head of the math department at Newton North. And uh, I said, I now work in a place where the guys can really use what you're talking about. Hmm. I said, well, where is that? And I said, it's a Walpole prison. I go, wow. Because as the head of a TM center there, I would get letters from the prisoners saying, can you come and teach me? And I would always have to write back and say, no, it's not, not really logistically possible. Well, there was a whole circuitous uh, route that was just uh, its own its own life with Bob episode all by itself to see how that could happen. Well, Paul is pretty heavy duty prison. Oh yeah, it was very heavy duty. And uh, <laughs> yeah, we uh, we created we created extraordinary light in that. And yeah. um, that created the basis of a lot of research and uh, it, it's still it's still influencing things today. So that's great. Wow that's my aunt worked as a counselor at the Walpole Prison for quite a while, one of my aunts. Well, that that she would have been in in Bill's department. Uh, Bill Clark was a DLM counselor. Interesting. Well, bringing light into a dark situation brings up this film that you just saw. Yeah. And um, now this is a this is a really good example of what we've just been talking about. Um, I've, this is a this film is about work that an artist named Peter Erskine created. Peter had been a faculty member at MIU, Maharishi International University, and then he moved to Los Angeles in the 80s and began a career doing mostly public art sculpture work, beautiful work. And I be they I became friends with him at that point. And I did a half hour film about his public art kind of work that was on PBS a little bit and so forth. And then in the late eighties, he discovered climate change because his daughter brought home a scholastic weekly talking about the ozone hole. And he got mad because he thought that it was unnecessarily scaring the kids. And he thought it was kind of BS. And, he went to the library and did a bunch of research and discovered it was not only ozone, but global warming and species extinction and on and on and on. And that's what stimulated him. He went, he had a kind of crisis, quit doing his art, spent a year or two come, trying to come up with something to address this. And at that point, I decided I'd start filming. I didn't know what he was going to do but I started documenting what he was going through and it turned into a 30 year process of wow. following what he did. And um, for those I, I could show you, would this be a good time to share? Yeah, yeah, why, why don't you show us, uh, show I'll us. Show, I'll, I'm gonna share, I have a website for the film and I'll share that and I'll, sh I'll run a little trailer that's about three minutes. And then we can continue talking. Does that make sense? Sure, absolutely. Okay, here's to it. Let me do that. Um, okay, I have to. There we go. Oops. Oh, there it is. Okay, so I'm gonna. This is the website. Um, as you can see, and that's Trajan's Market, mm -hmm. the site where the initial exhibition was, 
um, in Rome in 1992. And now I'll just, I'll run the trailer and you can, then we'll talk a little more about it. sacred stones or the sacred circles or new grange when the light of the solstice goes through the tiny aperture right at the exact time of the winter solstice and illuminates a dark cavern uh, that basic experience of light penetrating darkness is so primal and so archetypal and so relevant you recognize that you know what that is i mean that's your redemption that's your salvation that's where you want to be going when I first got to see the secrets of the sun, I began thinking how as a little kid you always want to get a pot of gold and a rainbow and suddenly here you are in the middle of the rainbow and you've obviously arrived. And it's so amazing when people love this piece and I, and I get more and more the feeling that um, it's nature that they love. That's what they love about it. It's not that they you know, see what they need because I you know, can do this and so I'm just kind of pretending nature to be cool for it. It takes you out of yourself. It takes you into another sphere. And you realize there are things bigger than you are. Looking back on the project now from a 20-year perspective, it seems to me that it is even more relevant and urgent than it was back then, because so many of these issues have been neglected by people in power, by the politicians, by the world leaders, and the past of the future in this moment. So, now, what was interesting about making this film, I mean, the whole thing was interesting, it's complicated, took forever, um, but Peter saw this artwork as a kind of um, polemical uh, awareness raising experience for people to wake them up about climate change. And it took so much effort on his part to make this happen. It was such a strain really for him to do this. As it says in the film, this is a guy that was a solo sculptor working by himself in a studio for his whole life. And suddenly he finds himself in Rome with a crew of 30 people speaking a bunch of different languages the Italians with their whole drama of doing things, um, you know, financial pressures, all kinds of distractions. And, and, and so he was very focused on just getting it done and, and getting the message out about climate change. And um, my experience while we were filming it, I went there several times over the course of a year and a half to film different aspects of the thing. 
was that what was happening was that we as a whole group, the crew, the film crew, Peter, even the Romans uh, hierarchy and governments, in making this happen, we were working to bring this incredible light, transformational light into a very dark place, which Rome, I mean, just look at the history, the Colosseum and so forth. Um, and it was, a, I saw it, my experience was that we were engaged in a kind of alchemical, metaphysical, transformational light kind of healing work for the whole human race. That's the way I was experiencing it. I brought this up to Peter, and he thought I was out of my mind. I was like, this, that's ridiculous, that's insane, and just kind of brushed it off. Um, over the ensuing three decades, he's come to understand that what he did, and this is very common in the making of art, is artists don't always totally understand intellectually what they're doing because they're tapped into something much deeper and they don't always understand it, but they're, they have trained themselves to be able to create these things and, um, and the disciplines and all that that are required. Now he does get it. And so in the film, it goes into, uh, it touches on the aspect of this work that resonates with art going back to the Neolithic times, uh, such as uh, Newgrange and Stonehenge and all these incredible earthwork art settings that have to do with astronomical issues and uh, fertility and all kinds of other cultural things. Um, and it really starts to get at the nature of what art is in our culture and why does it exist and, and why is it important? And, um, and it has to do with this fundamental transformational quality of the experience of beauty and um, in different forms and stuff. And so um, it was a, a, quite an extraordinary journey to make that film, not easy at all. Um, but um, I do think it touches on these things in a kind of unique way. And it brings up uh, an aspect of the dialogue that's going on right now all over Earth about the future of our species. And, you know, there are a number of people who, for instance, in terms of climate change, simply are in denial about the reality of that. Or if they agree that this is happening, they don't agree that it has to do with human activity. Right. And, um, um, everybody's had the experience of getting into discussions about this and generally they're fruitless. You don't, you're not able to convince anybody about anything there. And it's because these kinds of existential challenges like climate change um, are more, much more fundamental to people's sense of self and well-being and their place in the universe it's below the intellect. It's, 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 it's more fundamental than the intellect and therefore intellectual logical arguments aren't going to have much effect. You're dealing with issues of sense of self, of transformational necessity. And really in order for most people to come to terms with stuff like climate change, they recognize instinctively that this, implies that they are going to have to change. We are going to have to change. We are going to have to change quite dramatically, actually. I think um, that's my personal opinion. Um, right. We've dawdled for decades too long, but that's another subject. Um, uh, so, so this particular film does address that in the, in the person of Peter Erskine's journey. Mm -hmm. where he went through all this transformational stuff in his own life and has arrived at a much more conscious, wider, and heartful understanding of what it is that he's been doing and what art is about and the whole thing. So um, I think it's a very important thing for people to understand and recognize and try to 
become effective at managing and, and, and helping happen. So it's a challenge for all of these things. And I know you're, Bob, you're very involved in sustainable agriculture issues. And I'm sure it's the same kind of thing with, you know, uh, farmers that have, for whatever reason, had to become quite invested in the whole agribusiness corporate mentality of farming um, and not really be able to accept the idea that that may not be the best paradigm for the future of farming. Um, in other words, and well, this is part of what we were talking about before. And this is this fundamental, we're creating the future out of our thoughts. And one of the big formative structures of the future has to do with the idea of money and power. And that those are essential aspects uh, uh, to, of formative aspects for culture and civilization. Whereas there's another whole system of understanding that's about cooperation and community and sustainability and long-term thinking where the other thing is really very much uh, situational thinking and short-term thinking, gain profits and don't worry too much about the long-term. And those are the two dueling kind of worldviews that I think are competing for the future right now. Well, that's really fascinating, Michael. <clears throat> One of the folks who I really appreciate a great deal, and we've had him on a couple times on Life with Bob, is a fellow named Russ Concert, 30-year petroleum engineer, 15 years uh, in the exploration business working for Shell. In the last 15 years, uh, the head of all innovation in Shell and their Game Changer program. Yeah. We said that we looked at technologies that you can imagine and we looked at technologies that you could not imagine. And he attended Alan Savory's uh, seminal TED talk on ruminant uh, flash grazing as a way of restoring ecosystems and very uh, convincing argument and, and a lot of field work that showed that uh, in basically all areas of the world, there were native large ruminant herds who particularly in grasslands who would go through and they'd eat the grass down and their hooves and they would defecate and everything. And then they would not come back for what, a couple of years of a flow. Right. I don't know what the cycles were, but they would cycle around the plains. And um, so he, had kind of an epiphany and he decided that he would go into a different kind of carbon business. Mm. That is the recarbonization of the soil. Because when he heard the talk and he heard the pronouncement that uh, you could recarbonize soil at X rate, he said, that can't be true. So he went back to literature and he's a scientist, he's an engineer. He looked at it and he said, by God, they're right. Mm. He said, in fact, by doing this kind of recarbonization of the soil for not a huge period of time, you can recarbonize the soil at about the same rate that carbon is in the rocks that they find where they find oil. So he said it's kind of a, a circular thing for him. So he's created a company called Blue Nest Beef that is partnered with the Audubon Society with an established base of about 5 million people that they touch, a million and a half members, and five, four, five million 5 million people that they touch. And all of the beef that is shipped from Blue Nest Beef is raised with flash grazing techniques on ground that's certified by the Audubon Society. Because it turns out that we've lost since 1970, I think about a third of our birds. And a much greater percentage, about 50% of the grassland birds, because if you, all you have to do is go to Iowa and there are no grasslands, it's all corn and soybeans, pretty much. Yeah. And little vestigial amounts of prairie, but not even a percent, you know, just right. very, very, very small, the most altered landscape in the, in the country. And so what, you know, he started to look at how do you actually, you know, what, what can we do to turn that around? Well, 
what you can do is introduce these grazing techniques that mimic the bison prairie ecology or the wildebeest savanna ecology, but basically in our, in our world, in the Midwest, they mimic the bison prairie ecology. And so you create beef that is grass-fed and much, much better for you. You know, I'm not a big fan of eating lots of beef, but if you're going to eat beef, you should be eating grass-fed beef that has a very composition than beef that's finished on corn and that kind of thing. And it turns out that this is an extraordinary way to return both carbon to the soil and because with flash grazing, you have grasses that are tall, grasses that are middle-sized, and grasses that are short. And it turns out all of the prairie birds need a particular ecological niche, either short grass, medium-sized grass, or tall grass. And so that's a very hopeful metaphor for turning around our system that we've created that as people who have a little bit of an understanding of the structure of consciousness, when people don't understand where their thoughts come from, they don't understand the structure of consciousness, when they wake up in the morning, they have no thought of, wow, where does all this creative intelligence come from? They just kind of open their eyes and do their thing. Right. Because the, the senses are pushed to the outside. Yeah. Here they are, here we are as a species, creating environmental destruction and the 52 bombers and all of that, my view, because we don't understand who we are. Right. And we don't understand fundamentally, even though it's obvious, you ask anyone, did you make your nose or your eyebrows or your fingernails or your kneecap or whatever? And they'll say, well, no. And then I point out, well, you're actually living in rental property. Yeah. Who's the owner? Yeah. But we don't think about that. If we don't have to become religious, we can just become, we can, we can just make the, make the case that nature creates all of her or his or its beings, right? Whether you're a bug or an elephant or a human being. And so when we have an opportunity to tap back into that quieter level inside of us, and you and I talked about the beauty response, the idea of seeing something truly beautiful induces a little moment of transcending, a little moment uh, where the mind becomes quieter. And, in, and a quieter mind is, by definition, a mind closer to its source, closer to you know, the laws of nature that run the whole thing. And so somehow by virtue of the kind of perceptions that can happen with a fellow like, like Russ, who, you know, and he makes the point that we wouldn't be having the conversation if it wasn't for fossil fuels. We yeah. owe, we owe our civilization yeah. to the using of fossil fuels. Right. But if we don't make the transition out of that, those, those same, self same fossil fuels will make sure that this experiment on earth, <laughs> at least in terms of human species, doesn't work out so well. So right. anyway, we're not saving the planet. We're not saving the planet. We're saving the human species. But the planet yeah, the planet's going to rub along quite well without us, right? That's right. Na nature well, doesn't need us. I mean, we need nature. And yeah. as, as someone, uh, Dr. Forrest Shockley pointed out, he said, nature is commanded by obeying her. Yeah. It, this, this, stirs another whole kind of line of thinking that might be of interest. Um, it seems to me that in our predicament where we are right now, we need, we have this highly refined science, or at least it appears to us now that it is, um, which is the result of a whole series of knowledge developments and cultural developments going back to the Greek, to the Renaissance, to the Greeks and Romans, to Mesopotamia and beyond. Um, but that the scientific method and then the subsequent um, creation of, of democracies and, and um, other sort of social structures um, have allowed a huge percentage of the human race to rise out of poverty, 
to have greater education. There's been many very powerful, positive things about this. Right. And it's given us the ability to, you know, go to the moon and beyond and, and to understand quantum mechanics and all kinds of really terrific things. However, um, it's not holistic. It's, it's an unbalanced kind of understanding. And um, it's occurred to me that what is required is the blending of this highly refined kind of focus on the individual ultimately and, and on individual accomplishment and the intellect combined with indigenous wisdom and indigenous practices, um, which are very ancient. And, and I consider, for instance, the practice of transcendental meditation to be, because that is an ancient Vedic kind of not meditation and knowledge that goes back thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Um, and I think that it's a kind of cosmic setup that's happened here where the human race has been put in the position of having created this incredible techno world that could threaten the existence of the human race, but at the same time, it's a, it's a challenge for every single human to realize their full potential in order to solve and transform this crisis into what comes next which I think is kind of unimaginable for us, but I think it could be fantastically great. But without that challenge created by all these accomplishments, which have this dark side, um, you know, that we're now beginning to feel effects of, I don't know that humans would be impelled to address these deeper aspects of themselves and, and, and grow. You know, so in a way, it's kind of this huge cosmic uh, of challenge. It's interesting. And I, I do, I'm optimistic. I think that the human race is going to make this jump. Um, and it's not easy. It's not comfortable. It's scary. But at the same time, it's sort of like we've sort of, we've made the commitment to go forward and we've kind of burned all the boats and bridges behind us. We can't go back. <laughs> no, we, we, we really can't go back. We, and you know, it's interesting living in Fairfield, which is a little tiny metaphor yeah. for the intersection of creativity and consciousness and art and yeah. the thinking that, and it's certainly not just in Fairfield, but Fairfield is a really, great exemplar of that. The idea of even going back to the most fundamental questions that we have as a human being as to what are we playing this game for anyway? Right. What are we playing? The, what's the game? Yeah. Are we playing it? And what is it that we actually need to be happy? And wonderful John Eichert, a uh, legendary agricultural economist from University of Missouri, makes the point that he said, not all things that are of value can be assigned a financial value. Right. And he said, in point of fact, the things that we value most cannot That's right. be measured in financial terms. Yep. Love, appreciation, community, togetherness. And so, you know, what it seems to me is that there's a, there is kind of an example in ancient Hawaii before uh, before European settlers, you know, the European influence came. It was not in every way a completely peaceful thing. They tossed people into the uh, volcano for, for sacrifices and everything, the belly and all that. But if you look at the Hawaiian islands, there were two million people living there in virtually perfect harmony. Everyone had enough to eat. The land was sectioned from the top of the mountain top down to a down to the ocean, and different clans and 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 folks would have their section of the pie that would go yeah. all the way on Maui anyway, all the way from absolutely tropical to freezing cold in the middle of summer up on the top of Haleakala. 
Mm -hmm. And then all the way down, you know, temperate forest, and then, yeah. and and so, each each subgroup would have people who specialize in agriculture and activity at all the different levels, and and the whole thing worked, and so we can, as human beings, look at any successful indigenous culture. These cultures have been there for thousands and thousands of years. Why? Because they don't violate laws of nature. They operate within the structure of the laws of nature. When we start getting by half, you know, and our intellect gets in the way, and then we start seeing objects as more real than the subject. It's just like companies that see profit as the end point of their activity rather than a design criterion. I was having a conversation with a friend just uh, yesterday that if profit is the end point of a company's existence, then all kinds of mischief and horrific things can happen, right? Because it do happen. And do happen, absolutely. If on the other hand, every corporation, I mean, just I'm being a little wild here, but if every corporation was required to be a B Corp, the definition of a benefit corporation, where not only can you Take into it, take into account the social impacts and downstream impacts and all of that of what you do. You must by your charter. Yeah. And so it's just as a matter of what are we shooting? What are we shooting at? And and the issue is that if we're if the vast majority of humanity is stuck on Plato's level two of happiness, level one is linguini and cuddling and everything. Level two, level two is differentiation and better than and worse than. Level three is the happiness of of uh, altruism, and level four is spiritual transcendent. Said so that's the only level that can't be deranged. But if you got a whole bunch of people who never get out of adolescence. This is sort of things are there. Things yeah. are the things and the agreement. It is the nature of life to grow, right? Yeah. But if the only growth you have available to you is out in the world, then you become a cancer. That well, yeah. but I I would say that it, this is a kind of necessary thing of it's leaving garden the Garden of Eden, you know, uh, which I would say is an analog towards living a completely a life completely in accord with the laws of nature, right? And then, but the leaving the Garden of Eden and embarking on this path of what's led to the kind of worldwide culture we have now, short-term profits, selfishness, uh, being completely lost in the object, you know, all of that um, is a necessary step in um, the next stage of human evolution, in my opinion, is that it's like when a, when a being, are we done? No. No, no, right now, that was just a whole thing that popped up on my screen. Okay. We're, we're close to being done. Yeah, we're, we've got, uh, yeah, we're 901, so we're going okay. to we're gonna wrap it up and maybe maybe come back another time. Yeah, because really, it's an analog for the basic structure of manifestation, where a soul is in unified with the divine and then at some point decides to become to enter the relative limited world and why and it's to gain the wisdom of limitation that comes from limitation that when reintegrated back into the divine wholeness makes that wholeness greater okay and we are in a sort of analogous situation where um, the whole worldwide culture has developed to this high tech kind of disastrous but spectacular culture that is the that will destroy itself unless the human race can go through the transformation individual by individual to allow for the transformation of the world culture into a culture that's based on the laws of nature and is cooperative and all the rest of it so it's a it's an analogous kind of thing it's like we, the human race started out you know and there are still remnants of that in certain ancient cultures but by and large we've lost that simplicity and integration into nature 
but we've gained this kind of wisdom and knowledge right. that can we make the transition into another kind of level of wholeness, we will have all of that knowledge with us at the same time. Well, it's, it's given us the capacity to have the technology that we're using tonight, right? Yeah. Cell phones and computers and Zoom yeah. and, and circle lights and all of that. And yeah, it, it's, a, it's, really, it's really fascinating. So Michael, thank you for spending this hour. Yeah, this was great. Thanks so much. Yes, we barely uh, touched on hardly anything, but, but we touched on everything at the same time. <laughs> We're just going to have to come back, right? Yeah, okay. That's, uh, this That's is uh, Life with Bob with, uh, with Michael, uh, part one, part two, part three. So, folks, okay. thank you very much. Uh, thank you. you know, we're, not, uh, we're not streaming live on Facebook. We'll say hello to the Facebook folks because we are going to be uh, hosting this as a watch party. So, okay. Michael, thank you very, very Thanks much. Thanks so much. Fabulous. Take care. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.